OK, great. So let's get going with our next talk. Uh, this is one of the longer talks, 45 minutes, uh, which will go by at blinding speed, because our next speaker is Yehuda Katz, um, the man who needs no introduction. So take it away. Thank you. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about, as you might have guessed, the idea behind Cruft. Uh, so yesterday, Sandy gave a really great talk about the reasons that we get less satisfied with our projects over time. Uh, her talk mostly focused on the ways that using better object models, using better object orientation would avoid that decline, that steep decline in satisfaction over time. And I thought that that was, uh, I, I liked it a lot. I felt like to the extent that the problem is poor object design, poor structure, I thought her talk really provided some good tools that you can use to help avoid declining satisfaction over time. Uh, my talk is about situations where we cannot avoid this declining satisfaction simply by doing a better job ahead of time. Sandy told you how to contain the mess. Today I'm going to talk about how and when to clean it up. This talk is basically about the declining value of code over time. When you write a piece of code for the first time, it feels great because what the code does matches perfectly with the assumptions made by the code. But over time, those assumptions change, subtly at first, and then faster and faster and faster. This takes years often. Uh, in my projects, this always takes a long number of years. But the, the gap doesn't grow linearly. The gap between the assumptions that were true when you started building your application and the assumptions that are true years later actually grows faster and faster. And <clears throat> Year over year, you're going to write the same amount of code. People write lines of code that are the same year over year. But the weight of those mismatched assumptions, the gap between the assumptions that you made when you first wrote the code and the reality years later, consumes more and more development time. Um, here I have just a projection of the previous slide. If you assume that you're getting accelerating more and more and more assumption mismatch over time, you're able to write more code but the assumptions that were, incorrect, that were correct in the beginning but are incorrect now eventually catch up with you. This sounds a lot like classic technical debt, but there's a big difference. You take on technical debt on purpose. With enough discipline, you imagine that you can eliminate it altogether by thinking about technical debt in sort of in the way Sandy talked about yesterday, or you imagine that you can pay it down. You take it on on purpose and imagine that you will pay it down. The problem I'm talking about today is more like buying a bunch of rim stock in 2008 and never adjusting it when the company tanked. <laughs> and unlike technical debt, technical obsolescence will build up no matter how hard you try to avoid it. The question isn't how to eliminate it, it's how to plan for it. So today, since I do so much work with open source, I'm going to give some examples from the open source ecosystem. Um, and I think one of the reasons it's very uh, in sharp relief with open source is that open source works on solving problems very generically. And so if a problem is tricky, often that gap becomes a chasm very quickly as the generic, the assumptions made early on rapidly fall out of favor. Um, I've given a couple of talks uh, like uh, about things being hard. And you might want to watch this just to get a sense of sort of what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, I, I think this would be a decent companion talk. Um, but the basic idea here is for everything that seems straightforward, it seems like I say render, and then I render a bunch of stuff on the screen. Obviously, it's relatively straightforward. There's a lot more going on behind the scenes. There's a lot more assumptions that are building up. And that's true not only about applications that, uh, it's not only true about open source projects like jQuery or Rails, but it's also true about your own applications. Um, often, applications can take on the characteristics of frameworks or libraries over a long period of time. Uh, so a good example of this sort of thing is uh, jQuery's DOM readiness. Uh, API. And DOM readiness is something where solving the hard problems generically basically means that there's an assumption for every scenario and every use case. So it's not just one assumption, you know, uh, the assumption would be the browser does not provide a way to find out DOM readiness, therefore we will do this hack. That would be one assumption and one f outcome. But actually there are many, many different browsers and many, many different use cases that people are using this API for, which means that there are some assumptions that stay true for a long time, like in IE6, there is no way to find out DOM readiness without hacks. But there are other assumptions that drift over time, like 
in Chrome, there is no way to find out DOM readiness, right? So you end up with a situation where uh, technical obsolescence basically creeps up on you because for a long time, one of the anchoring assumptions of your API stays the same, but the other anchoring assumptions are slowly drifting away. So the gap is growing, but there's really nothing you can do about it for a while. Um, Rails had some examples of this. Um, security in general, almost all of Rails' assumptions that it made about security, the first time we ever built anything with security just turned out to be wrong. But again, these assumptions creep up on you. There was a pretty giant CSRF um, example a few, uh, a couple years ago where basically it just, it turned out that the entire assumption core that Rails was using was just wrong. And so obviously when that happens, it's sort of game over. But there's obviously gaps that start to build up over time. Um, encodings, right? In, in Ruby 1.8, there was no encoding support, and Ruby 1.9 shipped encoding, so now the assumptions have changed. But as more and more people move to Ruby 1.9, the uh, possibility of us using the change assumptions to do anything, um, I guess sort of, the, 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 the assumption gap grows, but the ability of us to do something about it doesn't necessarily snap into relief until for some time. Um, in Ember, we have, uh, this is sort of my, I'm early on, I'm early on in that big one, in that big gap, so uh, there's things that we're doing like data bindings or how you should build your application structure, where today the code that we're writing is still very much in line with the, with the assumptions that we're making, right? So data bindings, well, there's no data binding support in the browser, there's no object observation in the browser, so we're gonna use set and get, and so far that's true, and it's very difficult for anybody to come up with alternatives, but over time, that gap is gonna grow. Chrome is gonna ship object.observes, Right, and n we may not necessarily be able to do anything about it right away, but the fact of the matter is that the very clean, very clear assumptions that we have today, which are, we have no choice, we have to do everything ourselves. That feels good today and is a good reason for a whole bunch of architecture decisions that we're making, will slowly, slowly drift. And again, in open source, it's especially bad because you really can't, you have to wait until they drift where it, until you get this giant chasm before you can actually do anything about it. Um, in your app, you might be in, in a better place. And that's just a couple of examples. There's just a ton of things that every project does that are based on assumptions. And that's really the core of my talk today is that there are assumptions underlying every decision that you make and the constraints that underlie those assumptions, while they may be perfectly true today and following those constraints will make you happy as a programmer today, once, when those assumptions go out of style, when those assumptions are no longer true, that's one of the main reasons why you as a developer become less happy with the code that you write. And I think another interesting thing about open source is that this problem is, is worse with really good solutions, with great solutions, right? With good solutions, you can get away with having sort of blah, bland assumptions. You're AP, you essentially offload a lot of the assumptions onto your, your users, so you don't really have to change a lot. There's not a lot of the effect of the code that, of the library that you wrote that really changes because the user is responsible for keeping all that up to date. But when you have a really great solution, something that really takes, shoulders a lot of the burden for yourself, something like Rails or something like, I think, Ember, um, the end result of that is that changes in assumptions have rapid effects on the ability, on, on that gap. Right, so in Rails, if it turns out that HTML rendering on the server is, no, is a bad assumption, then it's not, it's not simply going to be, oh, no problem, you can sort of tweak around the edges. It's gonna be, it's a, it's a, it would be a big problem. I think Rails took some steps years ago to help mitigate this, but basically, if you, or if it turns out client-side development's a bad idea, nobody's going to do that. Ember's basically game over, because we basically took such a big bet. And this is sort of a, a side point, but a lot of times people don't notice the difference between how much, uh, between a partial and a full solution until the solution itself starts to break down. So um, you end up with sort of checkbox uh, oriented feature, uh, feature assessments. So you're like, oh, let me look at this library. Does it have any of these features? And um, there's sort of the reason I bring this up is that I think understanding the idea behind technical obsolescence is an important part in deciding what you're gonna pick. So if you have a project that's gonna be on, around for a very long time, you need to really plan for technical obsolescence. And I think people, when they do checkbox oriented feature, uh, feature analysis, they're not really thinking a lot about, okay, so there's this routing feature or there's this data binding feature. What assumptions underlie it? Now, there's sort of, uh, I think, a, a, big, a big objection to a lot of the things that I'm saying here and a lot of my philosophy in general, which is you can basically avoid all software problems. And actually, um, I think Sandy's argument 
is a weak version of this straw man. Um, you can basically avoid all software problems by writing, one, writing programs that do one thing and do it well. And then if something changes, if some assumption changes, no problem, just remove the little tiny piece of your program that has the violated assumption, replace it with something that has better assumptions, and no problem, that will be great. And I think writing good decoupled object-oriented software is going to be a way that you deal with certain problems. It's going to be a way that you deal with some problems. But I think that this kind misses some of the mark. And I think the reason is that this sort of this sort of thinking simply moves the complexity to rapidly evolving public APIs. So instead of ha having the complexity inside of private APIs, what um, Sandy called the omega mess, you end up with a very public and unstable mess. And unfortunately, no matter how hard we try, we usually don't get these interfaces perfect. And so this sh the idea that don't build any omega messes ever Instead, move everything to public APIs and public interfaces and write one thing that does it well. Um, I'm not saying that this is what Sandy said, but this is, def this is the uh, straw man objection. What this ends up doing is it ends up creating all these public APIs that people who are using the system have to understand. So it moves the complexity, essentially, from edge cases that are inside a self-contained component to edge cases that are now in between all these components. And in many cases, this problem pushes the integration tax onto the user. So uh, the user, instead of the user saying, I'm just going to use Rails, I'm going to type render, I don't really care what render does, I want to make sure it gets something onto the screen, now the user is responsible for saying, where do my templates live? How do I decide what template engine to use? Um, when I render a template with a partial, how does it know where to find it? Right? So you may have a very, very good interface. You may have a uh, path resolving interface that lets you explain to the, to the uh, template system, how to find other templates, but that doesn't mean that there isn't an integration tax that is being placed on the user. I also want to point out something that I find interesting. People almost never say the entire Unix philosophy, and I think it's because it undermines the, the point that they're trying to make, their over simpli overly simplistic point. The original Unix philosophy was, this is the Unix philosophy, write programs that do one thing and do it well, write programs to work together, write programs to handle text streams because that is a universal interface. And I'm not saying, uh, ha ha, I got you, Node is not about text streams, game over. What I'm saying is, <laughs> what I'm saying is, there has to be the idea of a well understood, well stable public interface in order for the idea of writing small things that do things and do things well to work. If you're in a situation where you're in the middle of building something, you're in the middle of deciding what your domain is, you're in the middle of figuring out what it is that you're building, and you try to build these little things that do things well and talk to each other, you're gonna end up spending more time thinking about the interfaces between these products than actually figuring out your domain. And early on in a project, in the unstable part of the spectrum, it's actually very important that you figure out, that you make your way to stability. Okay, I agree. So here's an example. So the Unix philosophy works really well when you're working with simple text formats. But in this case, even though it works, it would be better if there was just an answer in Git. And in fact, that's how Git has moved. Git started off with a very Unix philosophy oriented. There's a bunch of text that gets dumped out. Feel free to do whatever you want with it. You can run all these commands. But at the end of the day, once you get to a, a more stable understanding of what it is that you're building, having interfaces that say, I would like to know, give me my branch or whatever, works great. And I think another point that I would make about this slide is that it also relies on the idea that um, when you say text is the universal interface, there's actually something implicit there, which is people are using tab delimited or space delimited or some kind of sensible delimited output. If you have something like Git, which just dumps user-friendly output onto the screen in a lot of cases in order to get information, you're not necessarily going to be able to use the Unix philosophy to get, what, get done what you want to get done. And so I was thinking about this a lot, and one of the, uh, I sort of found an analogy in the idea of supply chains and supply chain management. So early on in the, in the stage of building a car, that's not a real car, but early on in the stage, in the, in the 19th century, when they first started building cars, people didn't really know what a car was yet. And so initially, the idea of vertically integrated supply chains, the idea of I'm just going to do all the parts myself, ended up being very effective. So it isn't necessarily how it started out, but vertical integration really won. It won the story early on in the process of building 
uh, cars because of the fact that there's the idea of a transaction tax. And basically the idea is that when you're not sure, when you're not really sure what's happening in between all the steps, in between all the pieces of the puzzle, there's a high tax to communicating between all the different pieces of the supply chain. So don't pay the tax, just do it yourself and you, could, you don't have to worry about standardizing things. You don't have to worry about figuring out how the parts guy is going to talk to the assembly guy. You're going to have the Ford specific version of that. And then don't worry about having the everyone specific version. But over time, vertical integration actually does give way to distributed systems. This, this happens in economics. And, but when does that happen? And the answer is that it happens in response to more standardized ways of thinking about things and a more reliable supply chain. So how does this fit in with software? So when you build components in software, components connect to each other very promiscuously. Um, you can be careful about this, but the end result, especially in an unstable system, is that you have a lot of components that connect to each other promiscuously. And the point that I'm making here is that every link in this, in this diagram represents a transaction cost. And typically, the cost early on in a system the burden of this cost is on the end developer, right? So you end up with, you have Sinatra, and you have, um, what's that, the shotgun, and you have Erubus as a separate library, and whose job it is, who ends up being the person that pays the transaction cost for getting all these things together? Why? That, that's Ford Motor Company. That's you. That's the person that actually puts it all together. So what happens over time, though, is that a lot of these connections fade away. We understand more what it means to build a car. We understand more what it means to build a web app. We understand more how you want to integrate between a template engine and Rails itself. And so a lot of the transaction costs become much, much cheaper. So instead of there being large transaction costs, the cost of thinking about, OK, how do I integrate Rails with Erubus? Initially, it's very expensive. You have to think about it a lot. Eventually, it becomes rather clear. Um, in sort of the way that it became rather clear how you integrate template engines in JavaScript. There's a function, it takes a context, returns a string, right? That's how it works in JavaScript. Eventually, that sort of happens on its own. Everyone understands what's going on. And integration gets cheaper. But integration only gets cheaper some of the time. And I think that's one of the main points that I'm trying to get across here, which is even though integration gets cheaper, it doesn't always get cheaper, which means that if you start off with the idea of, why don't we just front load the whole thing? Why don't we just build standards for every single link on this chain? We'll just say what every single thing is. We'll say how you look up templates. We'll say how you can talk to templates. We'll say how you render things. We'll say how you respond. You're going to have turned out spending a whole bunch of time building a bunch of standards that don't end up mattering, that don't end up really reducing transaction costs. It ends up being cheaper to not have bothered. Now, Rack is a really good example of sort of this life cycle. So early on in the days of Rails, basically this is what an architecture diagram looked like. There was Rails. It had a bunch of stuff in it. And then there was Mongrel, which had Mongrel Rails inside of it. And those were basically the same thing. So it was basically one giant thing. It was a vertically integrated supply chain. But why did we do this? I think in retrospect, it seems fairly obvious why would you not have Rack? Why would you not have some sort of standard? Java did it. Python did it before, much before R Ruby did it. So why, in the beginning of this process, did Rails decide not to do that? And the answer is that the, early on in the process, the costs of building the standards, the thought, cost of integrating with third parties, ends up, being bore, ends up being bared heavily on the big player. So Rails would have had to essentially build the marketplace. So Rails had to choose between figuring out what was going on, what does it mean to render, what does it mean to return a response in Ruby. We had to choose between that. I mean, I wasn't part of it, but Rails had to choose between that and spending a whole bunch of time to build a marketplace of third-party components. Now, what ends up happening is that there's usually small players. So Merb was an example of this, although Merb ended up being a pretty big player. There's usually small players that realize it's annoying as a little guy, it's annoying as Sinatra for you to have to actually build server connectors to every single thing. So one of the sort of side effects that happens early on is that, and this happened to Rack, is that people say, look, there's a de facto standard. You, Rails, please integrate with this de facto standard. And this is actually a pretty good bludgeon against an integrated solution. So when you start off in the beginning, 
you really want to just go get stuff done, build an integrated solution, figure out, figure out what the domain is, and don't bother to try to figure out what all the integration pieces are. But it's very easy in open source for a third party to say, hey, there's this standard, you should really implement it. So what happens after that? So it's very hard to actually fight back against that. So what usually ends up happening is that you have now a ton of standards, right? So Mongrel points to Rails entry point, points to session middleware, points to HTTP security, controller actions. These are all standards. Everything's a standard. And unfortunately, even when interfaces are standardized, there are still integration costs. And what basically ends up happening at the end, if you look at where Rails is today, is there are some parts of the system where you really want standards. You really want the Rails router to be able to route to a Sinatra app. That's a really important thing. And so the idea of rack is essentially very standardized. The, the cost of adding a new rack-like component to Rails got very cheap. This ended up being a big win. But there's other things like how sessions work in Rails, where Rails really pulled back. Rails said, we don't really think that it's a good idea for us to spend significant amounts of time working with the community to figure out a general session interface because it's costing us and our users a lot in terms of, oh, we realize there's a bug in our session system. Now we need to go through the entire process of getting a new standard. So there's still parts of what Rails does that even though theoretically you could imagine that it could be standardized, doesn't really turn out to be the case. And I guess the question that I would have you ask about all of this is who pays the integration costs? And the answer is never, Nobody pays them, they're free. You build a standard and it's free. Um, hopefully in a good world, the integration costs are spread out across a lot of users. Um, but the short version of what I'm saying here is in rapidly evolving spaces, tighter integration improves robustness. And that is a contrast to everything should be standardized. And I think one thing that's interesting about the whole Unix question is Actually, it turns out that Unix didn't build itself as a thousand people building one tool that happens, that happens to work. Actually, most of Unix's tools are, were built by AT&T and were obviously built to work together by people who, work, who themselves work together. Okay, so that's, that was sort of a, a sideline. What does this all mean for software? So what it means for software is cruft is inevitable. When you build something in the beginning, you don't know the whole story yet. You don't know what the domain is. I think this is as true in open source as it is true in your own personal applications. Maybe more in your applications than it is in something like Ember or Rails. So you don't really know what's happening yet. And so the cruft is not there because you're not, it, sometimes it's there because you're not good enough at object-oriented programming yet. But often it's not there, not because you don't know enough about object-oriented programming, but because you don't really know what you're building yet. The real world is a messy place. There's a lot of assumptions that go into the things that you're building, whether you're supporting IE 6, 7, and 8, are you supporting Ruby 1.8, are you supporting Rails 2.3, et cetera, all these, all these assumptions. And those are just assumptions about platforms. There's assumptions about your own projects as well, right? Maybe you're building a construction management tool. Maybe Congress passes a whole new construction management regulation and that changes everything. Maybe that happens slowly over time and the gap grows. Maybe everyone starts using computers instead of using fax machines. So in, in fact, solutions that you build as part of the projects that you're building are often ugly. But again, they're not ugly because you're writing software poorly. They're ugly because the assumptions, the, the people that actually power the solutions that you're building are ugly. They're crufty. Didn't mean to say the people were ugly. See previous talk. And the cruft that you're building is cruft that becomes obsolete over time, but it reflects the current reality of the ug ugliness of the underlying problem. Now here's a really sad thing about all this, which is that early on, early on when you add cruft, you're adding cruft for a good reason. jQuery added a lot of stuff early on because IE6 demanded it. But People often respond to Cruft in a sort of knee-jerk fashion. So early on, if you're writing a project and you have to deal with some ugly underlying problem, you are going to get really defensive every single time someone says, that code looks ugly. What are you doing? That's crazy. Couldn't you do something way simpler? You're going to get really defensive about that. 
And the really, really sad part is that over time in a project, especially as you have personnel turnover, the idea that the cruft is just there because it has to be there becomes received wisdom. And if you remember in my first diagram, I showed that that gap grows slowly. So in the first two years, this is the right thing to do. Everybody should say, if there's cruft, it's probably there for a reason. Everybody should say, don't touch that. It's probably there for a reason. We knew what we were doing. But as years and years go, come along, you end up with people doing a couple of steps that make the situation even worse. So you have, in, the, in, the good, in a good world, somebody goes and they says, what is this crop? This is crazy. This is stupid. They go and remove it. They spend a day refactoring. And then they get a test failure. And they say, ah, in fact, this received wisdom. Everybody says, don't touch that. They knew what they were talking about. There's a test failure. Aha. And in a bad case, which has even worse has even worse reinforcing behavior. You remove the cruft, everything passes, you go and ship a release, everybody freaks out, and now you say, oh my god, I have to revert. And again, that just reinforces, it reinforces the idea that everybody has that the problems are, every code, piece of code is there for a reason, the cruft is there for a reason. And projects end up developing immune systems. If somebody says, hey, I want, can I spend a day or a week refactoring this piece of code, everybody remembers the last 10 times somebody touched that, and they say, no, don't touch that code. Leave that code. <laughs> and this is basically, this is what Rails 2.3 was like. Rails 2.3 was basically, a lot of code was there for a good reason, but it was, there was so much code, and there were so many assumptions that built up over the years that were sort of implicit, that everyone said, don't touch that. It's probably there for a reason, don't touch that. But, over time, assumptions change. Over time, the th there's a lot of code in Rails 2.3 that was there for Ruby 1.8.2. There's a lot of code in Rails 3 that's there for Ruby 1.8. There's a lot of code that's in jQuery for IE 6, 7, and 8. And there's probably a lot of code that's in your app that was there because of some assumption that somebody made, good or bad, really early in the project that doesn't apply anymore. So here's an example from jQuery. We have a DOM node, and you want to put some data on it. Turns out IE is stupid. IE has a memory leak that obviously will never be fixed in IE6. That if you put some data on the DOM node and remove the DOM node, the GC never collects it. So, so here we try to remove the node. We have a memory leak. That sucks. So what does jQuery do? jQuery says, OK, we can put a number on the DOM node. Numbers are, don't cause garbage. And then we will go and we will create an, a separate cache that puts the data in that number. And then we will make sure that when we go remove the node, you always go through jQuery. When you remove the node, we will make sure to clear it. And that actually turns out to be a really good solution if one of your core assumptions is we cannot put data on nodes. But it's actually a lot of code, right? And this is, I think, this I think uh, it reinforces sort of what I what I'm saying, which is it's easy to imagine. Oh, it's an IE hack. It's probably like three lines of code. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes the assumptions that you make in your code, either old IE, Ruby 1.8, or whatever the assumptions are in your personal code, in your application, sometimes the assumptions really drive the entire architecture of your application. Your application, the first project I worked on involved Microsoft Project, and a lot of the assumptions that we made had to do with things that Microsoft Project did in the first version. But years later, nobody used that version anymore. And really, it, it behooved us to go back and think about whether the architecture of our entire application even made sense anymore. So the interesting thing is, as long as we support old IE, we're going to need this code. As long as we supported that old version of Microsoft Project, we're going to need that code. And this, is, this sort of explains that gap, that gap in technical obsolescence, right? As long the, the gap grows slowly, the gap creeps up on you. Because for a long time, the assumptions that you made, they may be becoming less and less relevant, but they're not irrelevant. So as long as you require old IE, you're going to need this code, which means you're going to build up an immune system because people, you know, Zepto's going to come out and Zepto's going to say, hey, jQuery, you suck. Why do you have this crazy code? You should remove this code. And jQuery people are going to say, ah, little do you know, but if you do that, you're going to have a memory leak in IE. I don't care. <laughs> right? But what happens when old IE becomes less relevant? And the answer, I think, is what jQuery did. Uh, about a year ago, jQuery did a full analysis of basically the entire code base to try to figure out 
we didn't do a good job of tracking our assumptions over time, but we did an analysis of the entire code base to figure out what assumptions were in the code base based on earlier browsers. And by keeping track of the reasons in the months and, and year ahead and analyzing that, we were able to determine what the cost of removing old IE was, right? So uh, I think there was, we've been receiving a lot of complaints over the years, hey, you should just remove all IE and there'll be thousands of lines of code you could remove. And for a long time, we just had this general feeling. The project had received wisdom that there just wasn't that much of a win. And in fact, it turns out in retrospect that that received wisdom was true, but only until IE8. After IE8, there's a lot of code. So what's the life cycle? What's the life cycle of a project? The life cycle of a project is, in the beginning, the cruft is a real solution. The cruft matches one-to-one -one with the assumption that goes into it. Over time, you develop cruft defensiveness. You say, I don't know, I don't know why we put that there, but it was probably there for a reason, or, or hopefully better yet, that's there for IE. That's IE fix. But over time, a gap appears, and unfortunately, the gap usually grows before it really becomes pressing and important that you deal with it. So you get, you, you get back into a crouching position. You, you man the fourth. You say, I am sure that this is a real thing. I, the, the, the ecosystem becomes, uh, circles the wagons. Right? The ecosystem circles the wagons around and says, so anytime anybody complains, and this happened, I think, with jQuery and Zepto. Right? Zepto came out. Zepto said, hey, you guys suck. Look, we can do the whole thing in one K of code. We said, hey, you're missing a whole bunch of stuff. You're not doing all this stuff. And it wasn't just IE, right? It's a whole bunch of stuff. And so over time, the received wisdom gets consolidated. And more and more, and no matter how big the gap gets, you always, as a project, have an excuse for why this is happening. But eventually what happens is some new person comes into the project, your application. Some new person releases an open source competitor, where it turns out that the gap got so wide that there was a lot of win that could be gained simply by readjusting the assumptions, starting the assumptions from scratch. And because of the fact that the normal mode of operation is consolidate, retrench, you usually miss it. You miss the opportunity to fix the problem. So what's a better way to deal with this? What's a better life cycle? I think people should track their cruft, maybe in cruft.txt, maybe cruft.markdown. I think people should, uh, sh when, they build, when they write some code that's not optimal, when they write a mess, they should write down somewhere, not in line in the code, but somewhere, what the assumption that went into that code is, and to allow future people to say, this assumption does not, is not valid anymore, we are going to remove that code. And I think this is especially important the more parts of your code base it touches. Again, I don't think it's ever possible to fully isolate these assumptions. You have to build code, you have to ship software, the assumptions are real. But it actually is very important for you as a part of your project life cycle to periodically say, that assumption that we made, is that true anymore? Ember is already starting to do this. We're, we're only a couple of years in and we're already starting to say, did things that came out over the past few years affect our original assumptions? Does the fact that older versions of IE, that ES5 is becoming a more valid thing for us to care about, does this affect our decisions? And in fact, it has. In fact, even in just a couple of years, there's things that we can do to radically improve our architecture just by taking advantage of the fact that one of our assumptions, which is we have to support old IE, is slowly fading. Right? Maybe we can't fully solve it, maybe we can't drop IE support, but we can really start thinking about how to, how to move forward. Now, on the flip side of that, it is okay for, a, for you to be the DOM library for IE6 users. If you had a construction management app that supported some old version of Microsoft Project, it is okay if you as a project decide we're gonna be the construction management app for Microsoft Project 98. That's totally fine. That might be an assumption that is still valid for your project. And I think that is, that is a valid conclusion that you can make when you're reevaluating your assumptions. And this whole discussion is not even just about the support matrix. Um, I sort of, I covered this, but there's a lot of assumptions, there's a lot of inputs that go into the decisions that you make. And I think, so a good, a good example of this would be Rails, right? So Rails, I think, is based around the assumption of rendering server-side HTML in large part. I think there's a lot of really good things that Rails does for JSON APIs. I use it for JSON APIs. But I think there's definitely a world in which the gap continues to grow. Right now, the gap is rather small. 
But I think there's a world in which the gap continues to grow. And so there's assumptions that enter into things like Rails and jQuery, but also your own applications that really don't have to do, I don't want you to take away from here, oh, uh, I should think about whether I still have to support IE6. That's definitely one large set of assumptions that goes into how we write our code, but there's a whole other set that are basically based on hu the human beings that use our product. So what do I want you to do? I want you to keep track of the edge cases in your code. I want you to keep track of the assumptions that enter your code. I want you to keep track of what the reasons that might, might cause technical obsolescence. And I want you to think about how those impact your architecture. So don't just, don't just say, I need to support IE6, that is an assumption. I want you to really think about what, how much of your architecture is based upon these particular assumptions. I want you to periodically review the decisions that you're making as a result of these assumptions. And I want you to make your choices more intentional. When you think about whether or not you're gonna do something or not, I want you to really think about what assumptions are going into that and I want you to document them. I want you to help contributors to your project or to an open source project make decisions without fear that they're walking on a grave. Thank you very much. Josh, do I have time for questions? Uh, yeah. My clock says 30 yeah. something minutes. Absolutely. So. Yeah, please. We, we, do, we do have time for questions, and I'm going to start. OK. Um, how about the test suite as a place to track cruft? Uh, someone else asked me the question the last time I gave this spiel. So I think the test, test suite is a good place to track cruft, and I think for every piece of cruft that you have, there should be a test. However, I think the, the point that I'm trying to make is there should be a place where that's the only thing that that thing's job is. Right, so there should be a file where the job is, here is a list of assumptions and how they affect architecture, and not, I am a new user, I'm going to run the test and see if they fail. Right? I think that's important. It's important that if there is IE6 needs to be supported, that you have tests that check for these IE6 bugs. Very important. Okay, so I can think of more than one occasion where I've been writing code to work around a bug or something like that that I knew would eventually get fixed, yep. and I wrote a test to make sure the bug was still happening. Yeah, and when I think it, that's And great. when it didn't happen, it would fail and tell me, take this code out. Yeah, so I think, actually, that's a really good strategy for things like IE6 bugs. Um, less of a good strategy for my users happen to use some version of Microsoft Project that has this bug. I think that, that we don't necessarily always test all those things. Maybe right. if we could test all of them, it would be great. Okay. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I, I think there's, you could sort of break what I said into two chunks. There's assumptions that are essentially code assumptions. They're, IE6 does this weird thing, or um, Ruby 1.8 does this weird thing, and then you can, I think you can really nail those with tests. And then there's a whole other set of assumptions, which are just human assumptions. Things that my, peop, my, like in my first project, the fact that everybody, all the contractors still use fax machines, right? I can't really write a test about that, but it is a core assumption. We had a lot of fax code. Okay, right? good, good point. So other people, questions? I always gotta work out at these things. So, so there, there are some uh, parts of your talk, particularly early on, that sound a lot like overfitting training data in machine learning. Is that a thing you've thought about as related to this? Do you, do you deny the connection or accept it? Or? Uh, can you say more? Sure. So uh, in machine learning, you have uh, I know what overfitting means. Okay. Draw the yeah, yeah, yeah. connection dots. Okay. So um, in machine learning, the overfitting is you take some training data and your solution is too perfect to that training data. Yeah. So then when you try it on a, 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 a an real. extension set, a real set of data, it is no longer valid. And when you put your graph up at the beginning of when you, draw, when you write the code event, uh, at first, the cruft is exactly a one-to-one -one fit to the current right. model of the universe, but that model changes over time. Right. So maybe in machine learning, what you want to do is take like a slightly worse hit on on training, right? Write a less than perfect solution. Is that something that could help us write code? Like, accept a slightly imperfect solution as a longer term, more stable solution? Yeah, I think especially, so uh, interesting connection. Um, I think especially insofar as we're talking about things where the trajectory is predictable, people will use less IE6 over time, right? Um, turns out to be true. Uh, people will use less of some current browser over time. You could perhaps be less perfect, although in a lot of those cases, you are forced to solve the bug for IE. But you, perhaps you could isolate it better, you can project. Um, I think 
I think that's a, a good solution. Um, I think the tricky bit, though, is that it's not that it's too perfect for some set of data. It's perfect for now, right? So you actually do want to write code that's pr perfect for now. If there's a trade-off between perfect for now and good enough for later, definitely take the good enough for later trade-off. Sometimes it's just like, does it work at all right now? And I think uh, to the extent that that's an important question, I think we should solve the problems that we have today, but we should make sure we understand what that's going to mean tomorrow. If this assumption is no longer true, how does that affect the code that I just wrote? There's somebody all the way up there. Uh, so like you said, uh, some of the things, uh, assumptions get too outdated. And since we are all operating in the open source world and not as big as Apple, uh, and like Apple said, we are not going to allow any flash play on iPhone. So when do you make that kind of a jump by saying that now IE6 is no longer a feasible option or the gap is too huge that it's going to take more work to support IE6? And when do you make that uh, sort of a judgment call and remove the old assumptions that are no longer valid? And the second part of the question is, how do you measure and bring, come out with this data of how big the gap is so that somebody can make the decision of removing that support? So I didn't really understand the first part of your question. Um, I can answer the second one. Uh -huh. uh, so I think tr thinking about measuring the gap is not right. I think the, the point that I'm trying to make is there are some assumptions, and you could intuit, you can understand that there is a gap that grows between the assumptions that you made when you wrote the code in the first place and the reality. Sometimes things don't change a lot. But in the fields that we're in, things usually do change a lot. So in fact, depending on how uh, on how close the solution you wrote was to specific assumptions, there's going to be a different amount of gap. So I think it's, it's more of a, a human question, right? So human, you have an, usually, usually the answer is a new guy came into your project, and he's asking some uncomfortable question, right? So someone came into your project, and he says, why are you doing it like this? That's a pretty good time to say, OK, we did it like that because we supported some old, there was a bug in some old version of Flash that we needed to support. Um, is that still valid? There's, a, there's a co some code in Rails that I think might still be there. It's like Safari 2 didn't strip out spaces at the end or something and like adds a null byte, right? So it's not, those cases aren't urgent, but presumably every time, when someone new comes in and goes through that code, they may notice it and it's good to know what the answer is, right? So the point I'm making is if you don't know the answer to why you're doing something, the answer is going to be please don't touch that. Um, hopefully the lesson to take away from here is Try not to have the ev answer ever be, please don't touch that. Try to have the answer be, here's the reason why it is, and the assumption is still valid, or it's not valid anymore. Are you leading, are you leading by example in this case, and uh, doing this on Ember, so, or some other project where we could look at how it works out in reality? Uh, yeah, good question. So um, I don't have a cruft.txt, but we do have um, architecture files that talk about the architecture and the reason for them. Um, after writing this talk, it, I have some more concrete, specific things to do. And I, de I definitely think that this is a good idea, and people should do it. I, um, the, the lesson came from jQuery, where I saw the amount of work that it took to reverse engineer what should have been cruft.txt. And um, I think that's always possible, and that's what you should do five years in if you're stuck. But I, yeah, I mean, definitely going to. I'm definitely going to be a lot clearer in the architecture files about what the reasons are for doing specific things going forward. Uh, that's it for now. Thank you very much. Thank you.